Um, welcome. Welcome back to everyone. Welcome to the new year, the new Bina 2020 year. Um, yeah, we're ready to go. Just uh, before we start, I don't want to ruin my punctual reputation, so I need to tell you this clock is fast. <laughs> we're, we're only a minute or two late. Okay. Um, so once again, welcome back. Hope, hope everyone had a, a decent rest. Um, and back and ready for another productive and meaningful calendar year. We have lots in store, so stay tuned. Um, but today, before we start our new topic, I just wanted to, just to mention a couple of things. First of all, a couple of announcements. A um, couple of things coming up. On the 12th of February, we've got <clears throat> a talk here with myself and Kevin Burmeister. I've just been in Israel and I had an amazing tour of Ir David, and he's the one behind a lot of the, the amazing excavation that is going on there. So he's actually going to talk about it. It'll be a fascinating, fascinating lecture. So that's uh, Wednesday night, 12th of February. So please come along. Also, I know there's a little few weeks away, we're putting your diary. Friday, the 28th of February, we're going to be having the Mindful Minion is back. So that's on the Friday night at 6.15. For men and women with explanations, meditation, different and meaningful, hopefully, um, a Friday night service. Also, you can put in your diary, 5th of March, we're starting a new Kabbalah meditation series, but watch the emails and they're all, all the information will be there. Also, on a... Uh, on a sadder note, I want to just pause for a moment just because when something happens in a community, it actually affects the community. As, and we know this from, our, from, from a lot of Jewish writing and, of course, in practicality. And I wanted to mention the extremely tragic passing of Josh Levi, the CEO of, of AJN. And um, I mention it because, obviously, he was a very, very communal person. But I also mention it because we actually had a very good personal relationship. And on a number of occasions, he helped me and helped Bina. Um, and I wanted to give that a special mention and, of course, dedicate today's learning to his neshama. And let's hope his family has strength and the community is only blessed with good things. So we've called this topic, No Worries. Um, and we're going to be dealing with... Uh, I come in, come in. There's some chairs here on the front. I don't know one likes to sit in the front of the classroom, but, you know... So we're going to be dealing with <coughs> yeah, we're all good? Okay. with uh, positive thinking and dealing with things like worry and anxiety and, and negative thoughts. So uh, how many of you worry? <laughs> okay. You don't have to put your hand up. It's okay. I knew the answer anyway. <laughs> so... I want to just make something clear, and I do this all the time, but I think it's very, very, very important. Um, I've done it when we talk about depression, I did this as well, and in fact I spoke about it at length at the Summer Learning Program, <clears throat> where I did a, a, a new series on mental health and the Jewish perspective, which incidentally I will do again sometime during the year, because it was a really important, uh, important topic. But one of the things I spoke about then was the difference between depression with a little d and depression with a big d. What I mean by that is because depression with a big D, as we know, is, is clinical depression. It's a, it's a sickness. It's often connected, more often than not, connected with a physiological uh, chemical imbalance and has physiological manifestations and so on. And for that, we know that the things that we talk about on a Thursday morning are helpful but not enough. In other words, they are not going to do the trick. For that, a person needs intervention. We need... Um, People need to seek medical assistance often, and so on and so forth. And I always want to make that very clear because I don't want to undermine that in any way. So I think with this topic as well, when we talk about worry or we talk about being anxious or anxiety, there's anxiety with a small a and anxiety with a big A. So there is anxiety which unfortunately is on the rise as a real disease. Uh, I don't know what the statistics are here, but I know in America <clears throat> it, it, it affects more than 19 million people. Um, that's adults, and children is a whole other story. And uh, overwhelms people and paralyzes people with anxiety and fear and so on. And that's not, that's not what we're talking about when we talk about what we're going to discuss. In other words, we're not talking about the 
every day, you know, Jewish worry that we all worry and get a bit anxious and uh, sometimes ruminate and, 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 and uh, sort of get in the way of our own growth because we're worrying about stuff we shouldn't worry about or getting anxious about stuff we shouldn't get anxious about. When we talk about anxiety with a big A, that's something that needs treatment, that's something that is not always controllable, and that's something which needs professional intervention. That, that, that's not to say the things that we're going to talk about aren't helpful. They are in conjunction with um, proper, proper professional intervention. But the discussion that we're talking about, and by the way, a lot of this, many, many reasons why it's so much on the rise, and, and technology has something to do with it as well, and social pressures and all kinds of stuff. But that's not really what we're talking about. What we're talking about is, we're talking about just the, the regular stuff. In other words, the normal, the normal regular worrying or people that worry about too much, the regular stress that we all sort of get into, uh, which bring often to sort of having thoughts that keep on our mind, which we just sort of keep in there, as we've always talked about, rent-free, and, and, and we get a bit anxious, or we, you know, we have negative thinking and negative perspectives, and that sort of stands in the way of our own development, and so on and so forth. And sometimes it, it's to a point where it's harmful, but not out of control. Meaning it's something we can still do something about, right? We can control it, and we can learn, by talking about the things which we're going to talk about over the next few weeks, we can learn to be more positive. We can learn to be more hopeful. We can learn to be more pos uh, um, optimistic. And we can learn to be more productive by controlling that process. I saw a little, uh, a little clip where someone is having a job interview. So the interviewer says, would you call yourself a hard worker? So the person answers, absolutely. I make almost everything harder than it needs to be. <laughs> So, that's what I'm talking about. Okay. Come again, there's, there's some seats here. So, that's what, that's what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about someone that is experiencing a real, what we call a real mental health issue, um, experiencing real anxiety on a clinical level. Again, the things we'll talk about could be helpful there as well, but certainly not enough. We're talking about the regular stuff, the regular things that we all get into sometimes, or we make things harder than we need to be. It's kind of natural, we all do it to a certain point. I mean, there are some very few select individuals who are very calm and never worry. And uh, if you're one of them, then you're probably the wrong address. But, but <laughs> most, of us, most of us are not like that. Most of us do worry, we do get uptight about things. Sorry, Sorry? About and the wrong religion. The wrong religion, that's for sure, exactly. That's why I thought we were pretty safe here. <laughs> So I thought I'm relevant to everyone here, yeah, so, <laughs> exactly. So, uh, yeah, very, very Jewish thing, exactly. Over worrying and, you know, Jewish mother worry and all this kind of stuff, okay. So I've called this series No Worry, so I'm actually going to draw a little bit, not entirely, but from a book by Sarah Edelman called No Worries. Um, she also wrote a book, Changing Your Thinking. Very, very good stuff, and I'll certainly bring in some of her stuff throughout, throughout the series, um, together with concepts, of course, from Jewish thinking. So, there are many, many causes, right? Many, many causes that cause stress, that cause worry, cause anxiety. And many origins, many causes, and also many, many different approaches and many, many different strategies. And they're all important, they're all important depending on what the situation is, depending on what the origin is, depending on what the cause is, and so on and so forth. And we're going to explore a lot of these different things over the next few weeks. Um, different perspectives, different mindsets, different strategies. Mindset strategies, feeling strategies, practical strategies, and so on and so forth. But for today, I really just want to give a general overview of the whole concept. What I want to do is, I want to just start with a concept of exploring the concept of thinking. The idea of thoughts, right? Because this is a lot of what it's got to do with, the concept of thoughts. So, in Jewish literature, and in Kabbalah in particular, we have this idea that there's three garments, so we call them the three garments of expression. They're called mahshava, dibur, and maaseh. Thought, speech, and action. In other words, human beings, we have intrinsic ideas and, and, and emotions, but the way we express them is either by thinking about them, speaking about them, or doing something about it, right? So those are the three, they're called levushim, the three garments of expression. Now, what's important to understand, and this is what I just want to make it clear for today, because it's a really important introduction, is that we need to split these three expressions into two. Because dibur and maaseh, speech and action, 
are very different to, to, to thought. Why? When we talk about speech and action, speech and action is how I express myself to something or someone outside of me. Right? So it's very, very external. It relates to the outside. If I don't have anyone to talk to, then I don't need speech. If I'm lazy and I have nothing to do, or I have nothing that I want to do, I don't need action. I can fall asleep. Right? Or I can just do nothing. That's number one. So Dibur and Dibur and says speech and action relate to the outside. Second thing we need to know about speech and action is that speech and action are not constant. I can turn them off, as well, some people find it hard, but you, you, we could turn it off, right? We could stop speaking, we could stop doing. I don't need, I don't need to be doing it. It's totally up to me in a very, very, not just in a very esoteric sense, but it's totally up to me on a very, very practical level whether I speak or I do, right? So it's, very, so it's very external, it's not constant, and therefore because it's really not constant and I can turn it off and it's really, it's more to do with how I relate to the world outside of me, it's fair to say therefore that Dibur and, and Maaseh, speech and action, are not really me. It's me how I am being manifested to something else. Does that make sense? In other words, it's not necessarily a full expression of who I am because when we speak we choose what to say what not to say we filter we we try at least to, to we don't always and, and and even when we're saying something that we're thinking we actually are very very seldom able to un, unless it's a tremendous amount of words and a very very good skill in in expressive language it's actually very hard to give the full manifestation or the full revelation of what I'm really thinking right now, when I, they, they, it does express me. In other words, different people speak differently and you can, sometimes, you can sometimes hear someone speak and certainly you see their personality come out, right? So it's very much connected to the person, but it's not the full expression of, of the, who, the really person, who, who the person really is. Same thing with action, right? Even action, by the way, you see a piece of art, you can kind of tell a little bit about the, about the artist. Or if you're really skilled, they tell about a great Hasidic Rebbe called the Mizritcha Magid who was able to see something that was handmade, anything, any object, and the person who had made it already gone. But he was able to look at it and, and, and sort of tell the personality of the person by looking at the piece of handiwork, right? That would be difficult today because everything was manufactured industrially, right? But I'm saying something was made by someone and something was formed by someone. So it's, 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 it is an expression of the person. Even action is an expression of the person, but not fully. Okay. And therefore, because that is true with speech and action, it is easy to understand that even though it might be sometimes difficult, but nevertheless it's easy to say or to understand that speech and action are fully controllable. They're fully subject to my choice. What I say and what I do is fully subject to the choices that I make. Right? I mean, on the basis that we subscribe to the concept of free choice, which of course we do. Right? Very, very fundamental Jewish concept. So I choose what I say, I choose how I respond, I choose what I do, and it's a choice. It could be sometimes a good choice, it could be sometimes a bad choice, but it's up to my control. It's very easy to understand that, and that's not a complicated concept. What is much more complicated is the concept of thoughts. And we need to understand this because this is going to be the basis of everything we'll be talking about over the next few weeks. Right. Thought is also a form of expression. But you know in Kabbalah they give a very, very interesting analogy of how we call thought a garment. Like a garment is something you fully control, you can take off, you can put on. But when it comes to, to thought, there's a very interesting analogy they, they, that they give. It's called the analogy of a turtle. Right? And just to use the words of Kabbalah, it says, Kahadein Kamtsa. Kamtsa is a turtle. The levushe mineyube. That's an Aramaic expression. Like a turtle who has a levush, it has a garment, but the garment is part of who it is. So that's the turtle shell, right? So on the one hand, you can look at the shell of the turtle or a tortoise, and you can say, well, it's not really the animal itself. It's a covering, similar to what a garment would be. But yet, it's the covering, it's the garment, which is part of the person, part of the animal. And that's the analogy that's given for the concept of thought. Because th 
thought is so much different to speech and action a number of levels first of all thought is a means of expression but it's a means expression of me to me it's really how I'm expressing myself to myself yeah you follow that it's completely connected with me it's inseparable I cannot it's it's a it's it's not me, it's, it's how I express myself. It's I'm thinking about what I'm feeling or what I'm, what I'm thinking and so, or what I'm intellectualizing and so on. So it is me expressing myself, but it's expressing myself through a medium which is inseparable from me. It is who I am. Right? I'll just show it you just so you, you get this a little bit clearer. Like there's a, there's a Kabbalistic analogy where they talk about Shabbat, right? Interesting thing. It says that uh, we know when God created the world, He created the world through ten utterances, through the medium of dibur. That's all another discussion to understand what, what that means, divine speech, what does it actually re represent. But, we, you know, we believe God has no physical form and so on. But, so, we have this concept that God created the world in six days. And then we always say, in fact, we say it in Kiddush every Friday night, this is what we're all brought up with and learned in kindergarten and so on, that on the sixth day He rested. So He didn't create, right? So, the problem with that is, as, as often asked in, in Kabbalistic teachings, there is a concept we have in, in, in Jewish philosophy that God didn't just create the world one time, He continues creating the world. As we say in our prayers every single day, God renews the creation every moment, every second, every day. In which case, if He doesn't create on Shabbat, so then how does the world exist, right? What does that mean, He stopped? And what does it mean He rested anyways? What is, what is that supposed to mean? He's worked hard. It was like difficult to create the world. I mean, I don't know. He's a god, right? So it shouldn't be that difficult. Um, so in Kabbalah, it says actually that's a misunderstood concept. Of course, he creates on Shabbat. But what it means is as follows: that Shabbat is different to the rest of the week. And what we say is that the world during the week is at the level of speech, and Shabbat, the world is elevated to a level of thought. What does that mean? So in other words, that means like this, that during the week, and I'm going to just say this briefly because I'm just bringing it in as a side point, just to bring it, make, make it clear. It, it really deserves its own discussion. But it means that during the week, God's relationship with the world is like something of the outside. It's like when, he, it's like when we speak. So when I'm speaking, it's not me. I'm, I'm, I'm relating to something outside of me. Whereas Shabbat, the world has a sanctity, has a holiness, has a spirituality to it, and the world is elevated to the point where God's relationship with the world and Shabbat is that of machshava, of thought, which means it's much more connected to Him. He's much more obvious than Shabbat for those that are able to see spiritual things, like great people. In other words, they can see that the energy of Shabbat is totally different. The energy of Shabbat is not, a, it's not an energy of something, so to speak, outside of God's existence, but it's something connected with God. His presence is much more obvious and much more connected because the world is elevated to a level of machshava, a level of thought. So I'm just, bringing, I'm just bringing that in because that also highlights this concept that the, the concept of Dibur is outside, it's external with the concept of Mahshavah. Yes, it's a means of expression, but it's me being expressed and it's inseparable from me, right? like the garment of the turtle. Which is why, of course, different to speech and action, it is why thought is constant. <clears throat> we can never not think, correct? When you say to someone, why are you not thinking? That's, that's, that's incorrect. You can say, why are you thinking badly? That, that could be true. <laughs> why are you thinking stupidly, maybe? <laughs> but not why, you, why are you not thinking? Because that's not there. Everyone thinks. We think all the time, right? If that's true, if, if thought is inseparable from me, and thought is constant, <clears throat> then the concept of controlling our thoughts becomes very complicated. Okay. And this is really the basis of the whole discussion, because we have to make this very clear. Because one of the fundamentals of what we're going to be discussing, and one of the fundamentals in Jewish thought, a foundation of personal growth, a foundation of, 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 of spirituality, a foundation of just growing as a human being and functioning effectively as a human being, is that with hard work, we can control our thinking. And that's more complicated to understand. We can say we can control our speech and action, yes. But we can control our thinking. And we have to believe that we can. Otherwise, this whole thing is, is, is not up for discussion, right? Which is so many feelings, which is so important because 
all the stuff we're going to talk about, like negative thinking or stress, worrying more than we need to, and so on, all come directly from the way we think. It is all directed by our thoughts. And therefore, if you want to do anything about those things, make them more productive, make them more effective, make them more positive, if we want to have a fighting chance of doing anything about these unproductive or ineffective or negative patterns of our functionality that stands in the way of our growth and our development, we have to believe and we have to tackle the issue of how do we change our thinking or how do we control our thinking. You just need to know what that means to control our thinking. Now, there is a very, very big foundation which we've mentioned many, many times. In fact, it's the... Oh, we'll see if I put that in a second. Yeah, um, <laughs> sorry, I put that a bit early. <laughs> Right? The fundamental, the fu a fundamental principle that guided the magnum opus of the first Chabad Rebbe called the Tanya is this concept of Moach Shalit Alalev, that the brain controls the heart. That we can control our thinking, and because we control our thinking, we can therefore control our emotions. It's a therefore. In other words, because a lot of our emotional responses and the worry and the negativity and so on comes from the way we think, if we control the way we think, we control the way we feel. The reason I put it up there is because there's an interesting story about that. It was in the time of Napoleon when he fought the Tsar. And Napoleon was very, very powerful and he, was, uh, he had conquered uh, many, many countries. And he was on the way to Russia trying to con uh, conquer Russia. Without going into all the details of the story, there was a, a fascinating debate among the great tzaddikim, about the great leaders, Jewish leaders of the time, that what's better for the, for the Jewish people? What's better for... Jewish survival and spiritual survival. Is it better for Napoleon to win or for Russia to win? Right? You know, we always ask that question. You know that story about the little kid that came to his grandfather who's come from the old country uh, way back, you know, in the 30s or 40s, and he said, Zayda, Zayda, no, the Yankees won. And Zayda had no idea what he was talking about. He said, that sounds really, really good, but just tell me one thing, is it good for the Jews or bad for the Jews? <laughs> so, you know, we, that's how we think, right? <laughs> so, but this was a more serious question, right? <laughs> What's, what's better for the Jews? There were those that maintained that there was a very, it was a fierce debate actually in, 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 in Hasidic history, in Jewish history and so on. There were those that, that maintained that Napoleon should win because physically, materially, we're better off for the Jewish people. And there were those that maintained that actually know that at that time, spiritually, Russia was okay and it would be terrible, it would be a spiritual destruction at that time. Not later, it was different, but it would be a spiritual destruction at that time and Napoleon would. The... Uh, Rav Shnei Zalman of Ladi, the first Chabad Rebbe, he was one of the great sages who was of the opinion that Russia should win. And he, in fact, so much so that he got involved in this concept um, that he s helped the government of Russia at the time, the, the, Tsar's, the Tsar's government, not because he was a big pal of the Tsar, but because he felt that was the most important thing to happen. And he sent one of his great Hasidim, and I've forgotten his name right now, I think his name was Rameir or something, he sent him into enemy lines to actually spy for the Russian government. And he went, he was a very, very talented person, a very a talented in languages and talented in all kinds of things. And he penetrated enemy lines and he was spying. And one day he was in a room looking at maps with everyone else. And Napoleon himself burst into the room and said, there's a spy here. And no one owned up, of course. So he said, I want you all to stand here and I'm going to listen to your heart because someone who's spying would be absolutely petrified. <laughs> and we know that the physiological consequence of being afraid, fear, is, is excessive heartbeat and so on and so forth. And he went and listened and he couldn't te tell anything. So someone asked the mayor afterwards, like, how did you do that? I mean, that's like crazy. Like, how did you manage to stay absolutely completely calm to the point where your heart rate was completely normal? So he said because he was a follower of the Alter Rebbe and he had trained himself to the highest extreme level of the foundation of the book of Tanya which is Moach Shalit Alalev that the brain controls the heart. And he was, now that's a pretty big level, I'm not sure we can, any of us can reach that but, but just that's, that's, that's the concept. Now, when, if we establish that to be true that we can control our thinking Again, and I want to go back to what I said in the beginning, that's obviously the exception would be someone who's really suffering from a particular condition that they've become out of control, in which case they need a different kind of intervention. 
but talking about normally regular on a regular day today, the, the, if we subscribe to this concept that we could control our thinking, it's very different to speech and action. Speech and action, to control speech and action, it means when we say controlling them, we could do one of two things. We can either channel or turn it off. Right? So if I speak to you and I'm, and I'm, and I'm tempted to speak negatively, I can do one of two things. I can either redo my script and I can talk effectively and positively, which is often the case and that's often the way we need to do it. Or if I'm not able to do that, I can just be quiet. Right? So that's, that's true. Same thing with action. I can be tempted to do something which is negative. I can decide not to do it in one of two ways. The more effective way sometimes is to replace negative action, negative behavior with positive behavior. Long term, that's the only way to do it. But short term, I'm able to control it, but just by turning it off. I say, okay, I'm not going to do it. I'm going to withdraw. I'm going to run away. I'm going to go into a room, lock myself in the room, or whatever the case is. When it comes to controlling our thoughts, we've established this foundation that you could control your thoughts, but you can't turn them off. That's the problem. That's where the complication is. Right? Because controlling our thoughts does not mean to stop to think. We cannot stop to think. So therefore, the strategy in controlling the way we're thinking is much more complicated. And it only really has to do with, we, can, we talk about banishing or ignoring the negative thinking, but actually it doesn't work that ultimately. We have to be able to learn to either change our thinking or replace our thinking with something else. We can never turn off thinking. And that's why the strategies are more complicated and more difficult, and that's what we need to try and explore. That's the first thing. The second thing to understand is this, that when we, when we talk about controlling our thought, it's also different to speech and action in a different way. In theory, we could control our speech and never say something negative, right? Someone who's in full control, the Chafetz Chaim, we've talked about it before, right? Chafetz Chaim who dedicated his life not to speak Lash and Hora, not to, not to gossip, but not to say something negative to another human being. And he pretty much mastered it, I believe, and, and that was a person who never said anything negative, right? For most people, when it comes to thinking, that's impossible. And it's okay that it's impossible. In other words, when we talk about controlling our thoughts, we're not talking about controlling our initial thoughts. We mentioned this before, but it's a very important concept, right? We all have negative thoughts, because we're human beings. Someone will say something to us, we'll have a thought of anger. Something will happen, we'll start to worry. Something will, uh, I don't know, there'll be, there'll be something going wrong, and we will, we'll, be, we'll be anxious about, about not getting to somewhere on time. Most people, not, that will happen to most people. Something will go wrong at work, and it's a bit stressful, we'll get stressed, right? That's not a problem, that's just being human. Because the initial thinking pattern is not something we can control. Thoughts come into our head completely beyond our control. What we are talking about, and this is the concept of managing our thoughts, is allowing the thought to remain in our brain, in, in, our, in our consciousness. It's allowing it to fester, it's allowing it to be there to the point that it becomes ineffective and it becomes destructive and it paralyzes and it actually stops us doing what we need to do. And in fact, most of the time, unnecessarily negative thinking actually undermines what we're thinking about. That's the way it works, right? If we over-worry about something, normally we're ineffective about dealing with that something. If we get overstressed at work, it actually undermines our functionality at work. Right? If, we, if, we, if we get anxious about something that we shouldn't, it normally paralyzes us and we're not able to do the thing, the, the very thing that we're anxious about. Right? Someone is going for an interview and they're petrified about if, if they're going to do well, probably won't do that well. Right? Because, because they're over-petrified about it. The initial thought about being petrified is normal. Most people are. It's how you manage it. So really what we're talking about is this concept, which I saw in a, in, a, in a really good TED talk by a guy called Guy Winch. It's called ruminating. Right? And we let our thoughts ruminate. Now, it's a very good talk. I'm just going to just quote from it a little bit because it sort of brings out the point. Now, in this particular talk, he, he talks specifically about work-related stress and his concept really is about taking work stress home with you. Okay, that's his particular thing. But I'm going to mention it because it's not the subject of our topic, but it's actually related to everything we do. Right? Because the truth is, the truth is like this. We need to understand what this means, right? When we think, some, when we think about something that's worrisome, let's say we worry about something. Worry is not always bad, by the way. Right? Worry is good, in fact. 
If we didn't worry, we'd be irresponsible. A certain level of healthy anxiety is also good. If we weren't anxious about every, anything, we would have no inhibitions. And you know what people with no inhibitions look like, right? So it's, 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 it's not pleasant sometimes, right? Because we actually have to have inhibitions. We have to worry a little, bit, a little bit what people think about us. We have to worry a little bit how we're going to produce, how we're going to function, how we're going to present, and so on and so forth. That's okay. It's okay, number one, when it's kept to a minimum. And it's also okay, and this is the point, when it's done in a controlled way, when I control when I think about it. So if I have someone in my family that's not well and I need to stress about it, which I do, because I need to worry about getting a better doctor, getting a better deal, getting, a, getting good care, and so on and so forth. It's, if I choose when I'm going to think about it, when it's relevant, and when I can then discuss it with someone else so I can actually produce good results, then it's a good level of sense of urgency, right? Although it's good worry creates a bit of a sense of urgency, and that sense of urgency is sometimes good, often good. It's the ruminating that's the problem. In other words, it's me continuously thinking about it and getting stressed about it when it's not relevant and when I can do nothing about it and it's letting those thoughts control me rather than I control the thoughts. We've talked about this many, many times. The difference between an effective thing and an ineffective thing or destructive thing often is not the thing itself, it's about who controls what. And that's true with so many things. Right? It's do I control it or does it control me? With me? And, and that's true with everything. It's true with iPhones, it's true with technology, it's true with everything in this world, right? It's true with guilt, as we've talked about many, many times. There's good guilt and bad guilt, there's good worry and bad worry, there's good technology and bad technology. And a lot of it boils down to one very simple question. Who controls what? Do I control it or does it control me? Right? If you cannot stop looking at your phone, then it's controlling you, it's a bad thing. If you can, then it's some, there's some wonderful things there, provided you're looking at good things, right? So with, with, with thoughts, that's why this, this TED talk actually brings it out very, very clearly, because it's the same thing. Negative thinking is not always bad. In other words, the thoughts themselves are not always bad. Even the stress is not always bad, provided it's, it's, it's under control. By the way, stress is not always a bad thing. We don't have to live a life that's completely relaxed. That's a, that's a very modern day society thing, which is ridiculous. Right? Life is actually made to work hard. We're supposed to work hard. We're supposed to push ourselves. We're supposed to feel the pain of working hard sometimes. It's, it's all good. It's about when it gets out of control and it gets into places and times where it's not effective and it shouldn't be there. And why is it there? Because I can't control it. It's controlling me. That's the problem, right? So he, this is a guy called Guy Winch. I don't know who this is, but he's, he's, he's a psychologist and he talks about how all his life he was he wanted to be a psychologist, right? Um, and as soon as he qualified, he said he opened up his private practice and he was helping people and it was going quite well. And he was doing well. And he says, one, one, the one year Mark came, and it was a Friday night in July. And he was walking home to his apartment, and he got into the elevator with, a, with another guy who was a doctor in the ER, in the emergency response area of the hospital. So the elevator started to go up, and then it stalled between floors. So he says, very really interesting. He says, and the man who dealt with emergencies for a living, his friend, began poking at buttons and banging on the door and screaming and said, this is my nightmare, this is my nightmare. Right? He says, this was the guy who was supposed to be able to deal with emergencies, right? And then he was thinking, actually, he, he realized afterwards, and he didn't say anything, he just sort of waited for help. And he was thinking about it afterwards, and he was saying, you know, I don't know why I didn't try calming down, that's what I do. And I do it quite well. But he realized at that point that one year after he had started working, he realized that he was burnt out, because he was on the way back from the office, he was completely depleted, and he just didn't have the energy, so he just didn't do anything. Why? Because he, so he said, well, maybe I've chose the wrong job. Like if, if, I'm, if I did something after a year and I'm feeling so depleted, well, maybe I'm doing the wrong thing. And he explains that that's when it dawned on him that he actually wasn't doing the wrong thing at all. He loved psychology. He loved his work. And he says, the problem wasn't the work I did in my office. It was the hours I spent ruminating about work when I was home. I closed my door to the office every night, but the door in my head remained wide open, wide open, and the stress just flooded in. Right? And he says an interesting thing, and this is sort of indicated about what's good thinking and bad thinking. He says, that's the interesting thing about work stress. We don't really experience much of it at work. Why not? Because we're too busy. Right? We're busy doing stuff. 
Right? We experience it outside of work when we are commuting, when we're home, when we're trying to rejuvenate. It's important to recover in our spare time, to de-stress and do things we enjoy. And the biggest obstruction we face in that regard is ruminating. Because each time we do it, we're act, act, actually activating our stress response. And he explains, says, what does it mean to ruminate? He says, to ruminate means to chew over. The word refers to how cows digest their food, right? For those of you unfamiliar, this is actually interesting because that's very related to the laws of Kashrut, right? For those who are unfamiliar with the joys of, cow, of, the joys of cow di- digestion, cows chew, then they swallow, then they regurgitate it back up and then chew it again. And then everyone laughs and it says, it's disgusting, but it works for cows. <laughs> it works for cows, it says, but it doesn't work for humans. I mentioned with Kashrut because, by the way, that's one of the signs of a kosher animal. A kosher animal is, a, is, a, is a, an animal that chews its cud and has split hoofs, right? Now, he says why, and this is the point, right? It's an important point. He says like this. Because what we chew over are the upsetting things, the distressing things, and we do it in ways that are entirely unproductive. It's the hours we spend obsessing about tasks we didn't complete, or stewing about tensions with a colleague, or anxiously worrying about the future, or second-guessing decisions that we've made. I had a discussion with someone a few weeks ago who was having a lot of stress at work for a very good reason. A very, very good reason. And he was going into the vacation period, December. Um, he was being really undermined at work, and it was a very, very, very stressful time. And he, was being, and he was going to the vacation area, and he was really, really stressed about how he's going to face work when he comes back after the break. Right? And, I, and I picked up that he was stressed, and I met him, and we had a, big, a long chat. And if he just left himself the way he was do the way he was operating, he would have gone into the vacation, not enjoyed it at all, and then come back and be completely not refreshed and walk into work the first day a complete wreck. Right? Anyway, we talked about it for a long time, and one of the things that came up, and this is not the only strategy, of course, but it's one of the things that came up was okay. So what's your strategy when you come back? So I came out. He hadn't really thought of that properly, right? And in other words, he hadn't really had a plan of what he's going to do about this, because he was too busy worrying. He was too busy stressing. He was too drained from the emotional stress of being so worried, which was perfectly acceptable, because I understood his situation completely. Right? So I said, let's, let's, let's reboot here. Right? Let's, reset the bu- let's press the reset button. I said, you have a problem. It's a real problem. You're in the right, by all accounts, it seems. So what do you, what's the plan? You are going to work, you're not giving up a job, right? In other words, there's certain things in life we're under a choice, and we've spoken about this before, so there's certain givens. The givens is going back to work, for the meantime at least. So what are you going to do? We work through, through some, some strategies. And it was almost like a weight lift off the shoulder, because I think when you work through a strategy and you have a plan, you're then able to kind of to put it to rest, right? Because he's, okay, he had a plan, he thought the plan would work. I haven't checked in to see how it did work, but well, hopefully it worked. But... A lot of times, the negative stressing, the negative thoughts, the negative ruminating, that we keep on rethinking, that I make the right decision, didn't I make the right decision, did I say the right thing, didn't I say the right thing, it's all stuff that has nothing to do with practical effectiveness. And that's why it's a really good line that he says that he realized that stress work wasn't happening at work, because at work he was too busy. One of the ways, by the way, to, to deal with, we'll talk about this in greater length, but one of the ways to deal with stuff like that is to get busy. I think I, 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 think I want to share with you, it's a similar concept, not exactly the same. I shared with you once uh, something that the Kotzke Rebbe said. I often quote him, he was a great Hasidic Rebbe with nice little witty, witty sayings. And he said that he wants his Hasidim, he wants his, ta- he wants his students not to do Averot, not to, not to transgress, right? obviously. <coughs> But he says he wants them not to transgress, not because it, they're doing wrong things or they, or they don't want to go against God or they don't want to do what it says against what it says in the Talmud or whatever the case is. He wants them not to transgress because they're just so busy doing good things they haven't got time to transgress. <laughs> that's what he wants. And that's a sign of a healthy person. A healthy person is a person that's moving forward, that's doing, that's, that's, that's working through stuff, that's plunging, that's, you know... When the Jews came out of Egypt, you know, this, this, was, this was sort of the model of this idea. When the Jews came out of Egypt, they came to the Red Sea. And when they came to the Red Sea, they were trapped, essentially. This was just last week's Prussia, right? 
Sorry, this is this coming Shabbat's Pasha, sorry. Um, so when, we, when, when the Jews came to, to the Red Sea, they got completely trapped. And then they turned around and they saw the Egyptian army pursuing them. And they were completely trapped. And then God said, and they started to panic. The Medrash tells a nice little story. The Medrash says that the Jews got split into four groups. I think I've said this to you before, but one of the miracles they say about the splitting of the Red Sea is that 600,000 Jews only split into four groups and not more. Right? <laughs> only four opinions. Imagine that. Three million Jews, only four opinions. It's crazy. That's truly miraculous, right? But anyway, it's split into four groups. One group panicked, and it was all to do with panic. Even the fourth one, which is fascinating. It was all to do with panic. One of them said, we just got to go surrender. Let's go back to Egypt. Right? One of them said, no, no, we've got to fight. Let's, let's, let's take them head on. Which wasn't very effective because they were a weak army. Much weak army. The third one said, let's just jump into the sea and end it all. And, and the other one, and, and, and the fourth group said, let's pray. Let's pray. You know, all else fails, pray, right? And God said, they're all wrong. They're all wrong. Why? Because you have a goal. I took you out of Egypt to get to Mount Sinai. So he says to Moshe Rabbeinu, he says, Daber el Bnei Yisrael, talk to the Jewish people. The Yisau, tell them to travel. Not even now, not even a time to pray. You've got to move, you've got to go. Because you're praying out of desperation. You're not praying because it's a good thing to pray. You're praying because you're desperate. You don't know what to do. You're in panic mode. So Daber spoke to the Jewish people, let them travel. There's only one problem. There was no way to travel. There was a sea. No, no, they had what to travel with, but they had, they had nowhere to go. Army was at the back, the sea was in the front. So there was one individual, says a Talmud, called Nachshon ben Aminadav. Famous Nachshon ben Aminadav. We learned so much from him, symbolically. And he said, God said, travel, you travel. Ah, there's a sea, so there's a sea, so travel. And he jumped into the sea. Not, he jumped into the sea to travel. And he walked in the sea until, until the water's up to his neck. And he said to God, okay, now what? And the sea split. <laughs> In other words, God didn't just split the sea before. He didn't just say, well, you guys are all in panic mode. Look, I'm going to split the sea for you and you can go. No. He said, deal with it a little bit. But don't deal with it by panicking and, and, and not knowing what to do. Deal with it by, by moving forward, by being busy, by getting to your goal, working towards your goal. What are you doing about your goal? You see, often we, we, we don't like to do things towards our goal because we can't see how it's going to work. We only see the problems. Now, sometimes the problems are real. I mean, when you've got Pharaoh's army at the back of you and a sea in front of you, those are real problems. But there's still problems. And sometimes what we do is we just fall into the mode where we only see the problems. And we only see the problems, we get caught in the problems. And that's where we dwell. That's where we live, in the problems. Nachshon ben Aminadav said, God said, travel, I'm not, going to walk, I'm not going to dwell in the problems. Ah, the problems are real? Okay, so they're real. I'm going to work on the mission. And he started to move. He jumped into the sea and the sea split. It's a, it's a, it's a lesson for life. But just getting back to our topic. So this is the point he's making. The point he's making is that often when we let... Thoughts ruminate, it's exactly that. We're living in the problems. Why? Because we're out of the situation where we can do anything about it. We're not at work anymore, in this example. When you're at work, well, you've got to deal with the next client. You haven't got time to worry about the problems. You haven't got time to worry about the stress. It's when you go home and you can't worry and you can't do what you're supposed to do. So what do you do then? You shift and you start living in the problems. The problem is, living in the problems where you're not at work, when you can do nothing about it, is completely destructive. And that's what he's talking about. So he, he, he talked about a lot of research, and there's amazing research about how much people take the stuff home with them. He says, first of all, ruminating about work, replaying the same thoughts and worries over and over again significantly disrupts our ability to recover and recharge in the off hours, right? The more we ruminate about work when we're home, the more likely we are to experience sleep disturbances, to eat unhealthy foods, etc., etc. And that reflects relationships, everything, right? So he says, as we said before, the only problem is it's a very difficult thing to deal with because ruminations are involuntary, they're intrusive, they pop into our head when we don't want them there. They upset us when we don't want them to be upset. Right? Anxiously worrying about the future feels compelling. Ruminating always feels like we're doing something important when in fact we're doing something harmful and we do it far more than we realize. So he started keeping a journal and he realized how much he's actually doing it and so on and so forth and he went through a whole process where he trained himself and he learned how to control that rumination, how to switch off, and how not to do it at work, and so on and so forth. So, that's the, that's, that, that's the gist of it. So getting back to what we said before, when we talk about what we're going to be exploring over the next few weeks, which is controlling those thoughts, we're not talking about the initial thought. We're talking about controlling the thoughts 
of when they happen, when they stick around, when we ruminate, and when we invite them or allow them to stay within our consciousness in times when it's completely ineffective and in fact destructive. And learning to cipher, to siphon off and to sort of select the good part of those thoughts and to use them when we need to use them, when it will be effective in terms of moving forward, in terms of planning, in terms of strategy. Because remember, like we always say, not being stressed does not, or not having anxious thoughts, or not having negative thoughts, and not worrying, all these things is not about going into denial. That's a very, very important thing. That's not, that's not the strategy we're going to be talking about, right? Because that's ineffective. Because sometimes problems that we stress about are real problems. Sometimes things that we worry about are real things to worry about. They're not things that we shouldn't be worried about. They are things that human beings worry about. The health of a loved one, the job, a job prospect, earning a living, our own health, whatever the case is, right? These are things, or, 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 or relationships. Relationships are things we need to put work into, and they're things we should worry about. Worry in a positive sense, right? The problem is negative worry normally, again, normally undermines exactly what we're trying to do. So, for example, one of the things anxiety, even low-level anxiety, actually does, it actually affects relationships in, in, a, in, a, in a negative way. It affects our physical being, and so on and so forth. So, but nevertheless, the things that we're talking about are not things that we shouldn't worry about. They're things that are, are, deserve a certain level of concern. Especially if there's a problem. If a person has a relationship and there's a problem in the relationship, they need to worry about it, meaning they need to do something about it. It's about when we worry about it and how we worry about it and how we let it control us rather than controlling it. That's what it's about. And it's about learning to be involved in the things we could control. It's about learning to give up and to let go of the things that we cannot control. And it's all of those strategies coming together. So just, just a, a few little points on, on, on sort of this anxious type of living. Because sometimes when we know what it is and we know where it comes from, it's easy to deal with because at least we know we can work out the strategy. So essentially, the way it works like this, we'll just finish with this in the next few minutes. Worry or being anxious is a response to a perceived threat. Right? That's what it is. Now, sometimes that threat is real. And that's also okay. But often actually it's not real, or at least the severity of the threat isn't real. Right? For example, one of the things people get particularly anxious about is how they're going to be perceived by other people. All right? That's a very, very big source of anxiety. And 95% of the time, that's a perceived threat. Right? We've said this many, many, many times, but being late to a doctor's appointment one time because you got stuck in traffic is not going to result in the doctor thinking you're a terrible, irresponsible person. It's just not going to happen. And yet we think it will happen because we stress out, or some of us do anyways, me included. Right? Um, so, so it's, it's a response to a threat. Now, God designed us to respond to threats. God designed us to respond to perceived threats. Because that's what responsible living does. If we had no response to threats, we'd all be finished. Right? <laughs> because we need to be aware. We need to be aware of our surroundings. We need to be aware of the things that threaten us, our, our health, physically, spiritually, psychologically, whatever the case is. So that's a, that's a response which God built in to our mechanism to be able to respond, to be a more on heightened alert, that's like the fight or flight response, if it's a real stress, to have a certain antennas and to be attentive and to understand the things that actually do threaten us. That's why we have this mechanism. It's very physiological, by the way, it's very physical. <coughs> right? That our whole, our whole body changes, our heart, our heart races, the adrenaline go, goes up and so on and so forth. Because that heightened alert is something that God created with us with in order to respond to real problems and to real threats. Anxiety or worry or excessive worry is about using that mechanism that God gave us in the wrong way, in the wrong place, at the wrong time. Right? Now the whole discussion of where it comes from, some people are more disposed to it than others. Um, they... Uh, they talk about, within the population, I'm quoting from her book now, the, the predisposition to anxiety, or trait anxiety, she calls it, lies in a continuum from very low to very high. Right? So that's, that's, that's different people. Now, I would, I would just share with you that what we're talking about here is not the very low or the very high. So the very low is normal. I mean, we're all normal. We all get stressed out. We don't need to go into a, a long strategy session to 
Now, how to never worry? We're all going to worry a little bit here and there, even when it's wrong. The very high can be much more complicated, needs better intervention. We're talking about the middle. The middle of what we all do, we worry too much when we shouldn't, and it stands in the way. That's what we're talking about. Where does it come from? I say 50% genes, 50% circumstance, a lot to do with parenting, um, safety attachment, like sort of the kind of attention parents give their children. Lots and lots and lots of things come into the role. The truth is, it makes no difference, as we always talked about. It makes no difference where it comes from. It's there. And it's there, and it needs to be de dealt with. And wherever it comes from, it could be dealt with. As we said before, the foundation of all of this is that we have thoughts. Thoughts in intrude and come into us involuntary. We can't actually resist it. But the good, the good news is that with a lot of hard work and a lot of good strategies, we actually can learn to control our thinking and therefore control that negative feelings that come with the negative thinking. And that's what we're going to explore in the next few weeks on a range of different levels to understand what we do and how we do that, what's the mindset and what's the